Hello, my name is Dr. Marnie Falk. I am the Executive Director of the Mitochondrial Medicine Frontier Program and Associate Professor in the Division of Human Genetics in the Department of Pediatrics at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I am excited to talk with you this morning about mitochondrial disease, a diagnostic approach update. I have the following disclosures. I am a scientific advisory board member on several foundations as well as several companies, including Ribonova and Mitocuria, on which I am co-founder. I am also research collaborator, consultant, or CHOP site PI on several pharma investigator initiated or farmer sponsored studies. It's always helpful to start at the beginning and recall what mitochondria are and do. As many of you know, mitochondria are subcellular cytoplasmic organelles. They arose approximately two and a half billion years ago from an ancient symbiont ancestor, a purple sulfur bacteria that could handle oxygen. This seminal event enabled multicellular life to evolve. And while it is widely known that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, Many of their other functions, besides energy production, are often overlooked. These include calcium homeostasis, initiation of apoptosis, or programmed cell death, the major site of free radical generation and scavenging, the first few steps in steroid biosynthesis, and many of the pathways in intermediary cellular metabolism, so much so that if metabolism is an orchestra, mitochondria are clearly the conductor. And as you can see here on the right-hand side of the screen, when people think of the primary mitochondrial function, they think of the electron transport chain that is embedded within the inner mitochondrial membrane, where intermediary cellular metabolism generates reducing equivalents in the form of NADH or FADH2 that generate electrons that go through complexes one or two to coenzyme Q that is embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane, which then passes electrons to complex three, to cytochrome C, to complex four. At this point, molecular oxygen serves as the final electron acceptor. As a matter of fact, more than 90% of the oxygen utilized in the cell is used right here to generate energy in the mitochondria. As this is happening, complexes one, three, and four pump protons from the inside of the mitochondria into the intermembrane space, creating a membrane potential or gradient that's used to power the fifth complex known as ATP synthase to generate energy in the form of adenosine triphosphate. This is done by combining adenosine diphosphate with inorganic phosphate to make adenosine triphosphate. And these phosphate bonds are what are broken to generate energy throughout the cell. Mitochondrial disease is highly heterogeneous. Any symptom in any organ at any age by any mode of inheritance typifies the overall class of how mitochondrial diseases may present. As was said two decades ago by our esteemed colleagues, Dr. Zunick and Rustem. Unfortunately, there is no common biomarker to easily detect mitochondrial dysfunction or disease in all cases, nor is there a single common genetic cause. Rather, it is now recognized that mitochondrial disease is the result of inherited mutation in any of the 37 genes within the mitochondrial DNA genome or within more than 300 genes within the nuclear DNA. The clinical features of mitochondrial disease are often highly heterogeneous as well. Most individuals have neurologic manifestations, including the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, and the autonomic nervous system. This may present with seizures, metabolic strokes, balance problems, migraine headaches, mood disorders, dementia and Parkinsonism, developmental delays or regression, as well as peripheral nerve problems and heat and cold intolerance. Many individuals also have sensory neural hearing loss, 
that develops over time, and a range of eye problems from eye movement disorders known as ophthalmoplegia to optic atrophy or retinal dysfunction. Many patients often have muscle involvement with weakness, exercise intolerance, and fatigue, as well as a host of non-neurological problems that may occur variably in different disorders affecting the lungs, the heart, the gastrointestinal system with dysmotility of really any aspect of the GI tract and liver involvement, a host of hormonal problems ranging from pituitary to adrenal gland to pancreas, fertility problems, bone marrow problems, orthopedic problems, and immune dysfunction. An example of some of the hallmarks of these conditions include metabolic strokes, pigmentary retinopathy, ragged red fibers, as shown as here, the upper right image, which demonstrates an increase of mitochondria building up along the periphery of the fiber, sideroblasts on hematologic evaluation, pseudo-obstruction in the gut due to dysmotility, and cardiomyopathy. A particularly common manifestation in children, as well as some adults, of mitochondrial disease is described as Lee syndrome. It is the most common mitochondrial disease pediatric presentation, often with individuals who are normal early in life but experience a neurodevelopmental regression between 10 months and 18 months of life, although this may occur later, often at the time of stress such as fever or infection, and associated with corresponding changes in the deep gray matter of the basal ganglia, the brain stem, and the midbrain, along with white matter changes that can be seen as well. It is now recognized that more than 95 different genes in both the nuclear DNA as well as the mitochondrial DNA can cause Lee syndrome. As a matter of fact, there is an international effort underway that I co-chair through the National Institutes of Health to curate by expert panel consensus all the genes that cause mitochondrial disease that manifests as Lee syndrome. This information is available on the website shown here at the Mitochondrial Disease Sequence Data Resource as well as on the ClinGen resource. While mitochondrial disease can cause a range of symptoms that may make it seem overwhelming or challenging to diagnose, there are actually several problems that are quite common in nearly every mitochondrial disease patient. We performed a survey of mitochondrial disease patients in the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network at the National Institutes of Health, as well as molecularly confirmed patients at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. In both study groups, the most common features, regardless of whether they were children or adults, included muscle weakness, chronic fatigue, exercise intolerance, gastrointestinal problems, as well as balance problems. Remarkably, patients on average each experienced 16 severe symptoms. This did not differ between children and adults. Therefore, it is quite clear that while mitochondrial disease may have some classical presentations, in many individuals it is a complex multi-system disease in which energy dis dysfunction and other aspects of mitochondrial dysfunction impair many organ systems. There are no single clinical diagnostic criteria that are widely used for mitochondrial disease in all cases. Many different criteria have been proposed over time by expert clinicians, although most have been heavily weighted on known clinical and biochemical features at that time. And often, the genetic etiologies for the syndromes were not clear when the criteria were established. Further, the classifications that these criteria often divided patients into were definite, probable, possible, or unlikely mitochondrial disease. And the implications for a patient of having a possible mitochondrial disease for years or decades were very uncertain, such that the international community has recently 
reviewed these classifications and suggested that probable and possible be replaced with suspected and that clear steps be made to further evaluate or refute the possibility of a mitochondrial disease in these cases. There are no common blood or urine biomarkers for all mitochondrial disease. While many have thought this should be lactic acid or pyruvate, unfortunately, they have low sensitivity and low specificity for mitochondrial disease in all cases. They may be high due to um, inappropriate phlebotomy that uses a tourniquet or a struggling child during phlebotomy, most commonly. Further, they may only be intermittently elevated in many cases. More recent investigations have suggested that FGF21 and GDF15 have diagnostic sensitivity in mitochondrial disease. However, this has been refuted in others, and there are many other types of disorders besides mitochondrial disease that may result in their elevation. Currently, it appears that these biomarkers may be most useful in certain subsets of mitochondrial disease, such as individuals with mitochondrial DNA deletions or depletion. Exercise testing, such as cardiopulmonary exercise testing that measures gas exchange during exercise, also has utility to non-invasively assess for key aspects of mitochondrial dis dysfunction, such as a premature anaerobic threshold or impaired VO2 max. On blood and urine metabolic screens, some analytes may increase suspicion, such as elevated alanine, TCA, cyclointermediates, ethylmalonic acid or 3-methylglutaconic acid, and alterations of acylcarnosine profiles suggested of disrupted fatty acid oxidation. However, neither their detection nor their absence is diagnostic of mitochondrial disease. The role of tissue biochemistry has changed over the decades for mitochondrial disease. Overall, mitochondrial disease is seen as a dysfunction of the electron transport chain, which is also known as the respiratory chain or the oxidative phosphorylation or OXFOS system. Collectively, dysfunction in the OXFOS system is the most common inborn error of metabolism, with a combined prevalence of at least 1 in 4,300 individuals across all ages. Historically, since the 1950s and 1960s, Tissue-based assessments of OXFOS have been performed by polarography. While this was the gold standard to measure integrated mitochondrial function, or how cells and tissues utilize oxygen when different substrates and inhibitors are provided, this is overall nonspecific and can result from genetic causes as well as medication or environmental causes. Further, it's very affected by the amount of activity somebody does, and it's very hard to know if there's an abnormality, what the exact cause of that abnormality was. In the United States currently, there are no clinical diagnostic labs offering polarography in muscle tissues. More commonly in the United States and around the world, electron transport chain enzyme activity analyses are performed. Whereas fresh tissue is needed to measure polarography or oxygen consumption, frozen tissue or fresh tissue can be used to study enzymatic activities. Therefore, this is widely accessible and utilized. However, in some instances, the results of the enzymatic activities are not the same as the polarographic activities, and there can be confusion about the cause of the discrepancies. Further, the degree of dysfunction that is truly associated with mitochondrial disease is widely variable. While less than 20% of a control mean for an electron transport chain enzyme activity is considered low, the 20 to 30% range is often considered a gray zone where it's not clearly diagnostic that an individual has a mitochondrial disorder. A mitochondrial disease etiology may best be thought of as primary or secondary. In primary mitochondrial disease, there is an inherited genetic-based mitochondrial dysfunction that is caused by a pathogenic variant in either mitochondrial DNA genes or nuclear DNA genes. In fact, 
More than 95% of mitochondrial disease genes have been shown to encode a protein or RNA that functions within the mitochondria. Often, primary mitochondrial diseases are chronic or stress-induced. By contrast, a secondary mitochondrial disease is one in which another disorder is primary, but mitochondrial dysfunction does occur. This may be either acute or chronic mitochondrial impairment. It can be a, gen a genetic disorder in which the mitochondria are an innocent bystander. It can be a toxic pharmacologic or environmental exposure. And aging itself is well known to cause mitochondrial dysfunction over time. And in these schematics, you can see that a primary mitochondrial disease, the primary cause comes from within the mitochondria itself, here where the car is shown as driving the further problems happening downstream of mitochondrial dysfunction within the cell. By contrast, in a secondary mitochondrial disease, where the bullseye is meant to be the other cause of disease, the mitochondrial here at the child becomes affected, but through no inherent fault of their own. Which genome contributes to mitochondrial disease varies across the lifespan. Typically, mitochondrial DNA diseases are thought to be less common in early life and more common with age. And by contrast, that nuclear gene mutations are to be the most common in individuals with mitochondrial disease early in life and less common with age. While these exact ratios used to be thought in childhood to be 90% nuclear in or origin and 10% mitochondrial DNA in origin, increased testing utilization and improved sequencing methodologies have now made it clear that this is more blurred such that mitochondrial DNA mutations likely account for approximately a third of childhood onset mitochondrial diseases, whereas nuclear gene mutations cause two thirds. It's helpful to think about the mitochondrial DNA given its unique characteristics to better understand what diagnostic approaches are needed to determine when a pathogenic variant is or isn't present in mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial genome in humans has 16,569 base pairs. It is double-stranded, and the mitochondrial DNA has no introns. Rather, it has a D-loop where replication begins, and the remaining portions of the genome are genes. These genes include 13 mRNAs, 22 transfer RNAs, and two ribosomal RNAs. All of the 13 mRNAs encode polypeptides that function within the electron transport chain complexes. All of the electron transport chain complexes, but complex two, contain a mitochondrial DNA encoded subunit. All of the transfer RNAs and the ribosomal RNAs encoded in the mitochondrial DNA help with the translation of these 13 mRNAs to make some of the core subunits of the electron transport gene complexes. The mitochondrial genome has key features that are necessary to understand to be able to accurately diagnose different types of mutations that may occur. In addition to having no introns, the mitochondrial genome does not undergo homologous recombination or meiosis. Its replication is continuous, not synchronized with the cell cycle. Relative to nuclear DNA, the mitochondrial DNA mutation rate is higher. This is because there are no histones that interact with the mitochondrial DNA, although nucleoids do exist. Mitochondrial DNA mutations may occur in a tissue-specific fashion and vary between three major types of, of disorders. The first are point mutations. These involve pathogenic variants in a single or a few nucleotide base pairs. The second category are deletions or duplications of large amounts of mitochondrial genome. Often, this includes several kilobases, and there is a common five kilobase deletion that is often seen. A third category of mitochondrial DNA mutations are depletion or proliferation, 
of the amount of mitochondrial DNA genomes. When this sort of copy number alteration is seen, the etiology is often not inherent within the mitochondrial DNA, but is reflective of a nuclear gene disorder. Mitochondrial DNA in humans is generally maternally inherited. There have been a few rare examples of case reports where paternal mitochondrial DNA inheritance has been shown. However, this is thought to be relatively uncommon. Rather, a classical pedigree that would raise suspicion for a mitochondrial DNA disorder is one that shows maternal inheritance. Here is an extreme example where in one generation, a male and both sisters are shown to be affected. Indeed, mitochondrial DNA disorders affect both males and females. However, what is unique is that only females can pass on the mitochondrial DNA disorders to their children through the oocyte. Since mitochondrial DNA are maternally inherited, they have been used to define haplogroups or fixed variants that occur in all mitochondrial DNA genomes in an individual that can be used to track human evolution. Here is an example of a human mitochondrial DNA migration map that is available on MitoMap that was established by my, my colleague at CHOP, Dr. Doug Wallace. And as Dr. Doug Wallace has said, the number of fixed homoplasmic mitochondrial DNA differences between any two people indicates the time since they shared a common mother. What's so important about this is that it teaches us that not every variant that is seen within the mitochondrial DNA is indicative of a disease. And as a matter of fact, ones that are fixed are often indicative of human population origins. This is very important to recall when interpreting a mitochondrial DNA variant report as a rare variant may be suggestive of a rare population and not a pathogenic state. The major mitochondrial DNA disease concepts that are necessary to understand to accurately diagnose a mitochondrial DNA disease are heteroplasmy and threshold effect. This reflects that there are multiple copies of mitochondrial DNA in every cell and tissue. There are between two and 10 genomes per mitochondrion and hundreds to thousands of mitochondria per cell. The oocyte, in fact, has hundreds of thousands of copies of mitochondria per oocyte. This results in a state of heteroplasmy or homoplasmy for a mitochondrial DNA mutation when it is present. When only the wild type mitochondrial DNA genomes are present, this represents homoplasmic wild type or a healthy condition. When only the mutation is present, this is known as homoplasmic mutant. What is more common in mitochondrial DNA disorders is one of heteroplasmy, where there are two different populations of mitochondrial DNA present in a given cell or tissue, meaning some are wild type and some carry a specific mutation. It is the ratio of how many wild type genomes versus how many mutant genomes are present that dictates whether or not there will be pathology. This is known as the threshold effect. The exact level of mutation that needs to be present to manifest with the disease is reflective of the degree of severity of that mutation and the tissue tolerance of an individual organ or individual person for dysfunction in that mitochondrial DNA gene. There are some mitochondrial DNA pathogenic variants that only manifest at very high levels above 80% or 90% heteroplasmy. And yet, when lower heteroplasmy levels are present, such as 5 or 10%, the classical severe mitochondrial DNA syndromes are not seen, but more mild symptoms, such as hearing loss or diabetes mellitus might be seen. This is the case for a common variant, the 3243A to G variant, that is known to cause a classical syndrome, MELOS, or mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke at very high levels, whereas at very low levels, 
it causes maternally inherited deafness and diabetes. Here you see a schematic to visually emphasize the key concepts of heteroplasmy and threshold effect. On the far left, you see a single oocyte that is heteroplasmic. It has a mix of mutated or red and wild type or green mitochondrial genomes. And while there are hundreds of thousands of mitochondria genomes present in the oocyte, after fertilization, the fertilized oocyte undergoes a series of cell divisions over the first few days. And this results in a bottleneck where very few mitochondria actually give rise um, to the actual cell that will form the resulting child. And whether that early stage embryo has a high level of the mutation load or a relatively low level of the mutation load is often stochastic or due to chance. And as that early embryo undergoes further cell divisions, organ progenitors that have a high mutation load increase the likelihood the different organs of the child will be affected, whereas organ progenitors that have a low mutation load increase the likelihood the child will be healthy or unaffected. And it's important to realize that this stochastic occurrence of mitochondrial genome inheritance leads to the difficulty with diagnosis later on where the level of the mutation in a given tissue may not be representative of the level of the mutation in the symptomatic tissue that is unable to be tested. It is helpful to consider a case to drive home how a single mitochondrial DNA mutation may give rise to multi-system problems. In this case, a male in the third generation was consulted on for having multi-system problems involving the heart, the central nervous system, the endocrine systems, ophthalmologic problems, musculoskeletal problems, and intermediary metabolic problems, including elevated lactate and alanine. On skeletal muscle biopsy, he had what was seen as Cox deficient fibers, best seen in panel C, as well as ragged red fibers, or increased mitochondrial proliferation, which is often seen in mitochondrial DNA disorders and shown here best in figures A and B. When the mitochondrial genome was sequenced in this individual, it was seen that at position 12,264, instead of the reference face of a C, instead a T was present in 34% of his blood sample. Yet his muscle was found to be homoplasmic for the mutation with no wild type copies present. Even more interesting is his cataracts, which were extracted, were sent for analysis and 100% of the cataract was found to contain the pathogenic variant. A buccal swab analysis was performed and similarly, he was found to be homoplasmic for the pathogenic variant. In this situation, where heteroplasmy is seen in one tissue and homoplasmy in symptomatic tissues is often concerning that a given variant is pathogenic. Familial testing is also important, and here you can see his father, who was healthy, had none of the mutation present in his blood. His mother was deceased, and testing in his maternal grandmother showed by a very highly sensitive method known as ARMS qPCR that she had 1% of the mutation present in her blood and 18% of the pathogenic mutation present in her buccal swab. So whereas the maternal grandmother was asymptomatic and healthy throughout her life, clearly she was able to pass on this pathogenic variant that was low level in her to her offspring. And her female children then could pass on and stochastically this mutation could become enriched in their different organs. While mitochondrial DNA variants are clearly a cause of mitochondrial disease, nuclear gene disorders often cause many forms of mitochondrial disease. And there are more nuclear genes that are known to cause mitochondrial diseases than mitochondrial DNA genes. This is because most of the proteins within the mitochondria are encoded by nuclear DNA genes. There's more than 1,500 proteins in the mitochondria and only 13 
come from the mitochondrial DNA. The rest are nuclear DNA encoded. This gives rise to a wide number of candidate genes, of which more than 250 have already been implicated in causing mitochondrial disease. It also explains why more than 10 to 20 novel gene causes of mitochondrial disorders are discovered each year, and this is likely to be the continuing the trajectory for the next several years. This slide emphasizes the point that mitochondrial disease may follow any mode of inheritance. When maternal inheritance is seen, this indicates a mitochondrial DNA mutation or a deletion. When this is the case, the likelihood of recurrence is low if the mother is not symptomatic, but it is not zero. Empirically, it may occur in up to 4% of siblings. However, if the mother herself is symptomatic, which is reflective of often a higher heteroplasmy load, the likelihood of recurrence in future siblings of the first affected child um, to that mother is up to 50% based upon empiric observations. Yet it is also important that aut autosomal recessive, autosomal dominant, and X-linked disorders are also considered for individuals who present with symptoms concerning for mitochondrial disease. And more than a dozen genes are known to variably cause autosomal recessive disease in some individuals and autosomal dominant disease in the other, depending on the exact mutations involved. No one gene causes a majority of mitochondrial disorders. However, the most common single nuclear gene to cause a mitochondrial disease is polymerase gamma, or POLG. Remarkably, POLG disease is highly heterogeneous with at least eight major phenotypes. These different phenotypes can manifest at birth or shortly thereafter, in early childhood, or in some individuals not until the teens or even uh, the adult years. The manifestations may occur in either a recessive or a dominant fashion. Common phenotypes are Lee syndrome or alpers huttenlocker syndrome, which is a seizure disorder, which when treated with certain medications can induce liver failure. There's also a range of eye movement disorders known as ophthalmoplegia or progressive external ophthalmoplegia that affects only the eyes or also other symptoms known as PEO plus that can be inherited in recessive or dominant fashion. And there are a range of adult onset neurologic conditions that may result from POLG disease, including epilepsy, myopathy, ataxia, and neuropathy spectrum disorders, as well as Parkinsonism. Understanding the structure of the POLG gene and its function helps clarify why such a wide range of phenotypes may be seen with POLG pathogenic variants. This is because POLG encodes this, the only polymerase that helps copy and repair the mitochondrial genome. There are two major domains, one of which is an exonuclease domain or a proofreading domain, and the other is a polymerase domain or a replication domain. There's hundreds of known pathogenic variants known to cause POLG diseases, but at most POLG disorders are 3% of all primary mitochondrial diseases. Depending on the site of where the pathogenic variants fall indicates what the prevalent phenotype will be. For example, pathogenic variants in the exonuclease domain lead to an accumulation of mitochondrial DNA deletions and point mutations with manifestations of ophthalmoplegia in the PEO spectrum. In contrast, Pathogenic variants in the polymerase domain lead to abnormalities of mitochondrial DNA amount, known as mitochondrial DNA depletion. And this is what is seen in alpers huttenlocker syndrome and manifestations including seizures, dementia, neurodevelopmental regression, cortical blindness, and liver disease. And it's important to know there are very helpful resources to help indicate which variants cause different features of POLG diseases that are available on the 
National Institute of Environmental Health uh, website that is run by Dr. Bill Copeland. And there is also a PolG variant pathogenicity prediction server that was reported by Dr. Laura, Lori Kaguni to help indicate which variants are likely to cause Alpers syndrome. It is helpful to think of mitochondrial disease not simply as dysfunction of the oxidative phosphorylation or electron transport chain system, but as dysfunction in specific molecular pathways that are affected by different genetic disorders. This is a very helpful review published in Nature Review Disease Primers by Dr. Granier Gorman et al. in 2016 that is a good starting place to review all the pathophysiology that may be seen and different therapeutic approaches that may be considered for different classes of molecular defect. For example, mitochondrial DNA requires nucleotide um, synthesis and import, and uh, this process goes awry in a whole class of disorders. The mitochondrial genome, as we were discussing with polymerase gamma, needs to be replicated and undergo transcription and translation to make the mitochondrial encoded proteins that form subunits of the electron transport chain. And this process goes awry in a whole host of molecular defects. There's also different classes of mitochondrial disease that affect mitochondrial dynamics, mitochondrial fission and fusion, protein quality control, ADP and ATP conversion and import, and a host of solute transport disorders across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Mitochondrial disease diagnosis today requires extensive molecular evaluation. As we have reviewed, primary mitochondrial diseases result from mutations either in nuclear genes or in mitochondrial DNA genes. Thus, all inheritance patterns may be seen. There are more than 250 nuclear gene disorders that directly impair mitochondrial function. And these genes may be grouped into several major functional categories. Genes that include the subunits of the oxidative phosphorylation system are involved in the biogenesis or the regulation of the OXFOS system, including cofactors to allow it to work, genes involved in mitochondrial DNA maintenance or expression, genes involved in nucleotide transport or synthesis, and genes involved in membrane dynamics most commonly. And while Pol G is the most common single nuclear gene to cause a mitochondrial disease with very heterogeneous phenotypes possibly resulting, it is still relatively rare as only up to three out of every hundred mitochondrial disease cases are caused by Pol G variants. When considering the extensive heterogeneity of mitochondrial disease, it is no surprise that next generation sequencing is optimally suited for its diagnosis. It has been shown over the past decade that there is improved cost efficiency as compared to individually sequencing single genes or performing candidate gene panels, as any single gene has a rare overall incidence of causing a mitochondrial disease in a given individual. There has been shown to be a clearly increased diagnostic rate when performing trio or kindred-based sequencing analyses. And it is also important to make sure that sequencing is performed of both the nuclear genome as well as sensitive methodologies to evaluate for heteroplasmic variants in the mitochondrial genome. By performing such sequencing approaches, the diagnostic odyssey over time has been reduced from decades or years to now months or even weeks. It is also clear that sequencing whole exomes or genomes gives a higher diagnostic yield overall than sequencing panels of known mitochondrial disease genes. This is because there are many secondary mitochondrial disorders or non-mitochondrial targeting genes that overlap with their clinical phenotypes. 
RNA sequencing and whole genome sequencing are increasingly being evaluated for their utility in diagnosing mitochondrial disease cases that are not diagnosed by mitochondrial DNA genome sequencing or by exome sequencing. Given the extensive genetic variability and wide range of knowledge needed to interpret variants that may cause mitochondrial disease, the community has come together to build the mitochondrial disease sequence data resource. This has been live and publicly accessible to academic users since 2014 at the mseqdr.org website. Registering and logging in allows one to see all the information available. There are modes for clinicians or for informaticians to support their direct analysis of data sets to identify variants in either the mitochondrial genome or in the exome to evaluate for mitochondrial disease. Further, a host of tools have been provided to allow individuals to browse data related to phenotypes, variants, and known genetic diseases from a gene-based perspective. I encourage anybody interested in mitochondrial biology and disease to log in to mseqdr to get a full understanding of all the tools and resources available. However, one particularly useful tool to highlight is MitoQuick Exome. This tool allows clinicians to enter in phenotypes either from a doctor's record that they can then annotate and pick annotated human phenotype ontology terms or to input the terms themselves. They can then upload their own variant calling file from an exome of an individual or a pedigree and within several minutes get mailed to them or download the likely genetic variant in the exome data set that causes the phenotype they have entered. On testing, the top hit has been shown to be the causal answer in approximately 70% of cases. So this is publicly available and may help in diagnosing challenging cases. This resource was developed by Dr. Li Shuang Shen, who is the bioinformatician who runs mitochondrial disease sequence data resource under Dr. Guy's leadership at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and with funding from the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation. Considering all that we've discussed today, an algorithm to facilitate mitochondrial disease diagnosis is provided here. When there is a high index of suspicion, a clinical detailed assessment and exam should be performed. This should include pedigree analysis and further phenotyping of an individual's symptoms. Non-invasive laboratory screening should be performed of biochemical analytes as well as secondary features that may be seen, such as endocrine dysfunction, dyslipidemia, anemia, or electrolyte abnormalities. Genetic diagnostic testing should be performed as a frontline test. This should include whole exome sequencing in the blood or sometimes non-invasive samples such as buccal or saliva in proband and their parents, as well as potentially affected siblings. Mitochondrial genome sequencing should be performed upfront when possible, and often this is available together at the time of the exome sequencing if it is requested. This should be done in non-invasive tissues first, such as the blood, urine, buccal or saliva, and hair cells. Of note, when a mitochondrial DNA deletion is present, a second test, such as digital droplet PCR, should be performed to quantify accurate heteroplasmy levels to confirm that the heteroplasmy level of the deletion is consistent with what would be causal of a mitochondrial disease. It should also be carefully evaluated what methodology is performed for molecular sequencing of the mitochondrial DNA as old-fashioned methodologies such as PCR have insufficient sensitivity to reliably detect low-level heteroplasms.
If a test is found to be positive, a patient should be referred to a mitochondrial medicine center for standardized clinical care implementation and offered participation in an emerging set of clinical treatment trials. If testing is negative or inconclusive, tissue testing may be considered at that time. This often includes skin sample to establish a fibroblast cell line and or a muscle biopsy and on occasion a liver biopsy if symptoms are present. Histologic and immunohistochemical testing should be sent as well as molecular sequencing of the mitochondrial DNA and mitochondrial DNA content analysis, typically by quantitative PCR, to evaluate for depletion, which would be indicative of a certain class of nuclear gene disorders. Additional biochemical testing, such as CoQ or fatty acid oxidation analyses may be performed, and research testing is also increasingly available. In conclusion, I hope you now recognize that mitochondrial disease is highly heterogeneous in both phenotypes as well as genetic etiologies. Therefore, molecular diagnostic testing is essential when mitochondrial disease is suspected. This includes highly sensitive testing for nuclear and mitochondrial DNA gene disorders. Tissue biopsies today often are only considered when molecular testing in minimally invasive tissues is unrevealing. However, this can still be quite important in the diagnostic search and include mitochondrial genome sequencing and content analysis in symptomatic tissues, including muscle. Biochemical and histologic investigations in these tissues may also guide the diagnostic process. And it is important to consider that a needle biopsy that can be performed under local anesthetic is now increasingly an alternative to open biopsies that require general anesthetics that may not be well tolerated in this population. Further, non-invasive methodologies are increasingly being developed to measure mitochondrial function. These include exercise-based testing, such as cardiopulmonary exercise tests, and a newer range of imaging-based assays are emerging, such as magnetic resonance spectroscopy and creatine cest analyses to evaluate mitochondrial function non-invasively. Thank you for listening to today's talk on mitochondrial disease diagnostic updates. I'm happy to answer any further questions.